Well, Mitch, we, when we think of Jesus, I think that obviously going through the Gospels, the earliest accounts are at his birth that we have in the Gospels. Uh, and we'll kind of get into it in a little bit why maybe that can be a problematic or, you know, have its own traps of falling into if we think that that's the first time that Jesus turns up in Scripture. Um, but let's talk a bit about this idea of Jesus being born at Christmas. There's a lot to unpack there. Just it in is itself. a huge amount to unpack. And we'll look at the what we call the incarnation when Mary was pregnant with Jesus next week with the Holy Spirit. But I think some of us unintentionally think, oh, Jesus sort of existed or started existing at the moment of his birth. Despite what 1 John tells us in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, which John's deliberately riffing off Genesis to say that at that moment when Yahweh spoke, Jesus was that Word, he's there with us, kind of can think that, oh, Jesus sort of wasn't around Mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. He sort of just started existing at his birth. And that's not what the Old Testament tells us. It tells us something different, that Jesus was around even back in those Old Testament times. Cool. And that's something that we can unpack a bit further today. But obviously, as we looked at last week, uh, the early church, a lot of the heresies that they had was around the nature of the Trinity. It's a confusing thing. Um, So obviously, the early church fathers had a few ways to address these heresies that were coming up. And I feel like the Council of Nicaea is sort of this classic one that we can look to that helps us to understand in a more concrete way Mm. some of the workings of the Trinity. So what is the Council of Nicaea? The Council of Nicaea was this... There was a guy called Arius, and he taught that Jesus was a created creature. He was basically God's first and greatest creation. He based this off um, Proverbs 8 about Lady Wisdom. And so Mm. what the church at the time did, they had to decide who was Jesus. Is Jesus just an angel, a creature, or is he the divine son of God? And so they had this big council in Nicaea to determine whether or not Jesus was actually the eternal, from eternal existent God. Mm. He wasn't just a man. And so, yeah, like we look at passages like I've got on the screen there, John 10.30, I and the Father are one. And so the conclusion was, as I've got there, I'm going to, be a bad presenter and just read what I've got on the sides. Jesus is of one being with the Father. Jesus is true God and God the Father is also true God. They are of one being, homoousis, of the same substance or essence. And that was the conclusion. That's been the orthodox Christian view since that time at the Council of Nicaea, is that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who's existed from before creation. Yeah, and I think that John 10.30 is a really helpful passage to be thinking of in a soundbite, I, Jesus, and the Father are one. This is sort of what the Council of Nicaea and then the Nicaean Creed, which was the creed that they wrote at that council, was trying to clarify and solidify that Jesus isn't a separate being from the Father created after the beginning, but he and the Father are one. And we can kind of see in those next two um, passages, both in John 1.1 and in Genesis 1.1, John is doing something quite intentional. Could we, Fraser, just get up that next slide of the two passages side by side? John, as he writes his gospel, is obviously a well-studied Jew who knows his Torah and is playing off Genesis when he's rewriting Mm -hmm. or maybe giving his commentary on the beginning of the universe. So, yeah, what what do we sort of see here? So in those brackets, I've got words that say enarche. And NRK is how John begins his Gospels. NRK ho logos. Probably one of the most powerful words written in Greek. In the beginning was the word. Now, obviously, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but for the Jews at the time who couldn't speak Hebrew, there was a, a, Greek, by a Greek translation of the Old Testament written. And that's how Genesis also begins. NRK, in the beginning. John is identifying Jesus just as with what we said before, just as a created creature, but the one who was there before time. He was the Word. And that is the, the, the mystery of God being this triune God. You see at the beginning of creation, the Spirit hovering across the waters, Yahweh God speaking. And John's saying is that those words that were spoken, that is Jesus. Mm. 
So this kind of then maybe challenges some of the understandings we have about Jesus as somebody who just pops up suddenly in the New Testament. Um, is he, throughout the Old Testament, sort of just hiding behind the throne of the Father and we never see him? No, Jesus is actually quite present. If you can see in that picture there, there's a whole bunch of different areas where we encounter Jesus. So we encounter him in this enigmatic figure called the Angel of the Lord. Mm. Now angel in my kind of english version i think of fat chubby babies Mm. right don't we because of the middle because of the middle ages paintings but in hebrew and this is the complexity of hebrew the word for angel is malak which can also mean sent Mm. or messenger Mm. so you could translate this as the messenger of the lord or the messenger of yahweh and so commentators have like studied the old testament thoroughly i didn't do this someone else did the hard work for me and there are 214 times that Malak is used, one third of them, and this is a fancy word, refers to a Christophany. This is a way of describing how appearance of Jesus before what we describe his incarnation, before he takes on human flesh. Mm. And so the question is, how do we know this? How do we know that this Malak, this messenger, this angel of the Lord is actually Jesus. That's a good question. Well, let's quickly check out a video, which I think will give us some hints um, and some places where we see this angel of the Lord character in the Old Testament. So, in the Bible, reality is made up of two overlapping realms, the heavens and the earth, our space and God's space. And while life here on earth may seem ordinary, sometimes we can encounter heaven right here in our own realm. Yes, this happens a number of times in the Bible. And when it does, we often encounter a fascinating character, the angel of Yahweh, or in most translations of the Bible, the angel of the Lord. Now we've talked about angels. They're spiritual messengers who perform missions for God. But the angel of the Lord is no mere angel. How so? Well, every time he appears, he's described in a way that's purposefully puzzling. And it leaves you wondering, was that an angel sent by Yahweh? Or was that Yahweh himself? What do you mean? Here's one of many examples. In the book of Genesis, there's a story about Hagar, Abraham and Sarah's runaway Egyptian slave. And we read this. The angel of Yahweh called to Hagar. But then this angel speaks as if he is Yahweh, saying, I will give you many descendants. And then Hagar responds and says, you are God who sees me. So the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh, but that can't be. In the Bible, you can't see Yahweh or you'll die. Yeah. So this story and others like it are inviting us into a paradox that Yahweh is above all, inaccessible to us. But sometimes he reveals himself to us in ways that we can see and understand. And that's where this character shows up. He's Yahweh made visible to us. Yes, distinct from Yahweh and also Yahweh. This is very similar to other biblical stories about prophets who get a glimpse into God's space, like Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel. And what they see is a glorious human figure on a throne who's called Yahweh. So the one on the throne and the angel of Yahweh, this is the same person. Exactly. Watch all this come together in the famous story of Moses and the burning bush, where we read, The angel of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And when Yahweh saw that Moses stopped to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So this person in the bush is called the angel of Yahweh, then Yahweh, and then God. And then later in the story, Moses learns that the figure in the burning bush is the one leading Israel out of Egypt in a pillar of fire and cloud. And that's the one who later takes up residence in the tabernacle. The tabernacle, this is the throne room of God himself. You got it. The angel of the Lord is the royal glory of Yahweh appearing as a human. Now, keep all this in mind as we start talking about Jesus. In the opening of the Gospel of John, we're told that from all eternity, Jesus was with God and was God. Distinct from God and also God. That's the same paradox we saw with the angel of Yahweh. Right. And then John says that God's word became human and set up a tabernacle among us. The temple presence of the invisible God. Exactly. Now check this out. There's a story about when Jesus took three of his followers up to a mountain and his true identity was revealed. He was transformed into a glorious human figure. Okay, I see what's going on here. So the angel of the Lord was God appearing like a human and Jesus is God now become a human. Yes, and notice this. In the New Testament, no one ever uses the phrase angel of the Lord to describe Jesus. Why not? 
Well, they wanted to avoid the idea that Jesus was merely an angel. For them, Jesus was Yahweh God become human in order to fulfill his ultimate mission to fully reunite heaven and earth once and for all. So I feel like there's still a lot to unpack there. Oh, I feel like we just ended there, the video said it all. <laughs> wow. So let's, let's go on a bit of a journey through mm. some of those moments that the video yeah. mentioned. And the first appearance of this angel of the Lord takes place at an unusual point in the story. It's not sort of with one of the patriarchs of the mm. faith. It's not with one of these heroes of the story so much as Hagar and Ishmael. Hagar mm. obviously being Abraham's sort of maid servant or Sarah's maid servant mm. and, and Ishmael being Abraham's in, in some ways illegitimate firstborn son. Mm. What is going on here? The angel of the Lord appears to them. Yeah, so this is just after Hagar's been kicked out. And we kind of, I think a lot of Christians have a negative view on Hagar and Ishmael and all that. But yeah, we see here, so here, as, the, as Hagar is here in the desert, as the text tells us, and she's thinking that they're going to die. And this is always a clue to look forward to, which what the video said, you look for who the first figure you, that a person encounters. And we see here, the angel of the Lord found Hagar. And then they kind of have this conversation, but then the narrative shifts. It shifts here to she gave the name to Yahweh who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Mm. It's this remarkable, like what the view says, this remarkable encounter where there's this figure, whether it be, and if you Google paintings of Hagar and the angel, they paint this sort of, you know, Typical Christian angels, big wings and all that. But it seems to be so much more than that. There's just so much depth here. And this is why I love this, is you can't kind of put this into just a neat theological box mm. of like, who is God, who is Jesus? Because we're kind of left just wondering. Obviously, God makes these crazy appearance to people mm. as this angel-like human figure which also is a hint that what Jesus does when he incarnates isn't totally outside the realm of what the Old Testament's been talking mm, about. Because often we kind of think, oh, wow, like there's just the Father and may maybe the Spirit in the Old Testament know Jesus. We see here God appearing in different forms or different persons actually has lots of precedent. And that's kind of the one takeaway I want you to take away from this is to recognize that, that a Jesus appearance, it's a wild mystery, but it's not outside the realm of God's character. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's the first appearance. Yeah, and I think that this is obviously, a, it can be a tricky thing at times because an angel doesn't mean God. It's the angel of the Lord who recognizes themselves and takes the authority of mm -hmm. God in the way that they speak. And that's an important mm -hmm. difference, that there are still heavenly beings, angels, who aren't God, but this specific angel or messenger of the Lord has a unique status and mm -hmm. speaks in such a way that almost seems like, as the video said, a contradiction in some mm -hmm. ways because they are both a messenger of God and speak with the authority of God and yeah. identify themselves and other characters identify mm. them as yeah. God. Yes. Okay, so... Is, your, is everyone's brains blown by that? It's like, yeah. whoa, how do you process that? Right. So, well, let's look at the next yeah. moment in Scripture where... And there's lots of moments, but these are just some like really big ones. Abraham. Oh, we all know the story of Abraham and nearly sacrificing Isaac, but... Have you ever noticed that at the moment when Abraham has the knife, someone who, who calls out to him? Someone be brave. Don't be shy. Yeah, angel of the Lord. I'd never really noticed that before. It's the angel of the Lord calls to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, and you think, okay, it's just an angel. But then he says something unusual. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Isn't that fascinating? Mm. So in my mind, like, it was just an angel. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, an angel kind of rescuing him. But then you read the text, you're like, oh, there's something deeper here, something much deeper. Yeah pointing to Jesus. So that's another great one. Um, and the next slide, we're going to kind of do this. Oh, here we go again. Jacob. Jacob. So we, have you familiar with Jacob's dream? Jacob, he's um, fleeing from uh, his brother 
uh, Esau, who was um, trying to kill him because he'd taken the birthright. And there in the, um, in the desert, he has this dream, the stairway to heaven. And so what's interesting is in the stairway in heaven, he sees heaven open up, angels of God descending uh, up and like down this ladder, and he sees Yahweh. There's a bit of, it's a bit hard to understand. It's either Yahweh at the top or Yahweh at the bottom. And so he says, oh, wow, like this is this powerful encounter. And he calls, um, well, um, yeah, he he's, recognizes that God's presence is here. And he wrecks this, Bethel, let's see, he wrecks, the, I had a mind, but he wrecks the, an altar and calls the place Bethel. And then years later, Jacob here has a dream. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see all the male goats mating with the flock as streaked, speckled or spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing for you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. And so there, at that moment where Jacob's there at Bethel, he sees Yahweh, he sees God on the staircase of the angels around him. Here in this dream, this angel of God, which is an unusual expression, it's usually the angel of the Lord, he's identifying in straight, I am God. So here again, we're just seeing this mystery playing out, God going in another person, but still being one God. Uh, and then Moses in the burning bush, yeah. when we read this passage carefully, we see that it's not just a shrub that's on fire, that there's something mm-hmm. within the bush and there's something yeah. that is not just a voice of God but a figure of God present mm. to Moses there. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah. Um, so God's presence for the Israelites, it was the angel leading out in the daytime and fire at night. And fire represents God's holiness. And so, yeah, again, it's God appearing as like this fire, not in a person figure. And as, as we've just been talking about, this is just the God, angel of Yahweh. This begins here with the angel of Yahweh appearing to him, then it shifts to Yahweh. And this, what's important about this moment with Moses is that God reveals his name. He said, though, Moses, one of the things that Moses is worried about as he leads the Israelites out mm-hmm. is, how are they going to believe me? He says, he uses the name of I am has sent you. God reveals this name. And in the ancient world, names held power. You got, if you knew the name of a God, you could call on that God's name to twist their arm, to use their power. And when God's self-revelation of what we say is Yahweh, which may or may not be right, but I am, I am has sent you. It's this idea of God's eternal existence, God's unchangeable nature. And it all starts with just the angel of the Lord. So again, we're seeing God's appearance here, not necessarily in a person form, but in a fire. Mm. One last, one last moment. In one the last moment. Where it pops up. There, and there's, there's, yeah, at least three or oh, four that I can more. think of off the top of my head. So mm. it's probably a helpful exercise for you guys next time you're in an Old Testament book, especially the first couple. Um, this angel of the Lord figure. Is, is appearing a lot and it's definitely yeah. an interesting revelation into what this means but Gideon in Judges and this messenger of the Lord what's going on yeah. in this story and, and what's cool about Gideon and it comes up a couple of times is Gideon's actually set it up like a new Moses mm. so Moses he whinges heaps he goes oh, I can't speak I can't lead the people Gideon says something similar I'm too weak to lead and so you're meant to sort of see Gideon and Moses having this similar story and yeah, the angel here, as it kind of in that artwork depicts the you know, typical, you know, white-skinned angel with the wings, but encounters this angel, this this person figure, and then the angel, just like Moses with the fire, he strikes this altar. Mm. And there's a fire, and Gideon sort of realizes, oh my goodness, I haven't just seen an angel; I have encountered Yahweh, mm. and so that is sets forth the. Gideon's calling to rescue the Israelites from the Midianites. So you might have lots of questions that that has brought up. Just uh, we'll bring up that QR code one more time. Just if anybody has some more questions that they want to um, bring, we'd love to chat about Mm. them and unpack them a bit. Um, But let's talk a bit now. Obviously, there's the angel of the Mm. Lord. Um, and then we see the idea of Yahweh in human form, Mm. which is sort of a slightly different thing again to the angel of the Lord. And so in Genesis chapter 18, now this is truly bizarre. If we can just have that up there. 
So Abraham, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Now you read that, like, okay. Yeah, you're kind of imagining a fire, a storm, some sort of wind, something like that. Appears at the great trees of Mamre, where he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. Okay, what on earth do you do with that? Like, there's that, it's clear, the text is clear, like, these are three people. And Abraham sees them, he hurries to the entrance of his tent, he meets them, bows down, and if you know the story, he gets Sarah to prepare this meal. Mm. They, they sit down and they feast together. It's the moment when Yahweh reveals to Abraham that he's going to have a son next year. It's where Sarah laughs and that's where the name Isaac comes from. It's this hugely important moment in the life of Abraham. But keep in the back of your mind that there's three men there mm. in human form. Mm. Who all speak at the same time together with one agency. <laughs> yeah, and then, well, and then in Genesis um, eighteen sixteen, we're told when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Now this is the part that just blows my mind. Then the Lord said, "Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do?" Now just reflect on that for a moment. The three men. One of them who was identified as Yahweh says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? When I re read this story before going to, not sorry, this narrative before going to Bible college, in my mind I thought, oh, God must be in a cloud in some sort of like supernatural thing, this revelation, but here, he's a man. And if you've ever watched the Bible show, they actually interpret this moment as with Jesus. They use the same actor for Jesus. Like recognizing that somehow Yahweh has appeared in this human form. And then the two angels go off to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. And that's all the narrative tells us. And we're left sort of wondering, going, what on earth is God doing here? Mm -hmm. And actually I noticed a question came yeah. up on this very next slide. Yeah, we so, get another appearance. Yeah, the question was, do you think the commander of the Lord's army in Joshua 5 is an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament? What do you think? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and yeah, if you read this again, question. it is a great question. And you read the text here, really, really similar to Moses. What, what does the commander say? He says, you know, take off your shoes. The, this is the place that you are standing is holy. And Joshua worships him. He bows down before him. Yeah, it's another bizarre moment, these encounters in Scripture. And one of the things we spoke about last week was a lot of people see the Old Testament God as a God of wrath and anger and hatred. And Jesus is love and forgiveness. This changes your whole perception of Jesus. Mm. If, yeah, this, well, obviously, like, Trinity is like Jesus is always there, but. Actually here, this commander of Yahweh's armies mm. is Yahweh. Mm. Probably Jesus. He's the one leading the charge. Because the ancient world, warfare wasn't just on a physical plane. They believed there was a spiritual dimension to it. So human armies were actually representing what was happening in the spiritual world. And we get just a little snapshot of what was happening here is that actually Yahweh's commander is leading this charge into Canaan. Mm. Uh, there you go. Put that one in your theological box for a Sunday morning. It's Yeah, and then, and then obviously the idea of the Son of Man is then a title that we see come up multiple times mm. in Scripture, um, both in Old Testament and New Testament. Um, but the idea of the Son of Man in Daniel is a vision. Mm. This is a, a, a strange thing that I think that we can normalize a bit because we sort of can become a bit, you know, saturated in scripture and not sort of suddenly be struck with this weird idea of the son of man. But the first time this, this idea of the son of man kind of comes up is, is striking and weird mm. and enigmatic. What is going on and, and what would have the first readers of, of Daniel and this mm. prophecy been actually wrestling with in this idea of the son of man? So, so what's cool about Daniel is Daniel just beforehand, he's seen these four creatures coming out of the ocean. And if we know Genesis, where does life begin? What's happening? It's the ocean, the Spirit of God hovering over the deep waters. And so out of these oceans come these terrifying beasts, and the, the sea represents evil. 
And so you've got these four empires in this ghastly, almost anti-creation form. And they kind of have some human characteristics to them, but they're not really human. And what that represents, four different empires, and Christians have a whole bunch of different views on that, and that's not the point of it today, is to represent there's these four empires. They'll be stronger, they'll get weaker, weaker, weaker. And then when this fourth beast comes out, we see one that is like a son of man. Now, when God created Adam and Eve, they're created in the image of God, and they were called to rule over the earth, to subdue and to rule it. Mm -hmm. Now, humans have failed that. So now God is showing that there's actually going to be a son of man. God himself is going to take over that. And so we see here, see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days. That's a, that's a way to describe Yahweh, to describe God, and was led into his presence. Humans don't go into mm. God's presence. Mm. When they do, they die. They get struck down. That was the whole point of the tabernacle. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations, peoples, and every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Mm. And so in Daniel chapter 2, you know, the giant statues are gold, silver, bronze, and clay. So those sort of prophecies kind of marry up. You've got four kingdoms. And then with the Daniel 2 prophecy, like a slingshot, like a rock thrown, then the tower falls over and the mountain grows to take over the whole world. Similar here is this idea that after these four empires will raise up one who is like a son of man who will rule over all the world. And like in Sunday school, the answer is either God or Jesus. Yes. So... So that we've probably it's going to feel like some people we just like went through a breakneck oh, speed we, we through did, like yeah. the entire in, Old Testament. Yeah. So if you know we sort of maybe you know had a micro sleep there at some point, um, what is the big takeaway from all of these passages that we've looked at just then in the uh, Old Testament? The big takeaway is that God is obviously a mystery, but God will appear to His people in a form that's one but separate. Mm. Just like Jesus. Somehow, somehow Jesus is God and man, but he's also still part of the Trinity. And that's been going on throughout all the Old Testament. There's not something unusual that there is precedent for this. There's a precedent. Yeah. I'll so we, We've got a question as mm. we kind of go into a bit more of New Testament mm. Jesus. Um, and it says, um, didn't the angel of the Lord, in brackets Jesus, mm. appear to Mary and said she will bear a child, i.e. Emmanuel, Jesus? Yeah. Great question. Well, the answer from that's from the video. The New Testament is really clear not to identify Jesus with the angel of the Lord. And so it's kind of the caveat we have to make is not every appearance of the angel of the Lord is Yahweh. We have to look for those clues, which is a character encounters the angel of the Lord and then the, the text shifts to make that identity Yahweh. So there are some times where a character literally just, ju just meets the angel of the Lord and they angel, so messenger it's not, of the Lord. Yeah, so it's not always Jesus. So, so that's always that was why we went through all those verses to see how the text shifts from the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon or to Moses, mm. and then it's like, oh, Yahweh. Mm. And so that's the clue to look forward yeah. to. So in the New Testament, yeah. any encounter of an angel is just an angel. Sure. And this idea that suddenly they are not just speaking with the authority of God, but as God yeah. in that yeah. in that idea. Okay, great. So, with Jesus now being the Son of God, we see in the New Testament he's identified as Yahweh. Yeah. Now, what is what is going on here then? And in, in we're taking all of this in that we've got from the Old Testament of the the angel of the Lord, and now going into this with Jesus, mm -hmm. flesh and bones, feet on the ground being identified yeah. as Yahweh. Yeah, so the Jews were so frightened of misusing Yahweh's name, they wouldn't say Yahweh, they would say Lord, Adonai. So if you go through Old Testament and you see Lord in capitals, that's basically Adonai. And so in Greek, the translation of the Old Testament, the, what we call the LXX, they would use Kyrios, Lord, to describe Yahweh. So you read along, you'd say Kyrios, Kyrios, Kyrios. In the New Testament, Jesus is identified as Lord, Kyrios. John 20, 28, Thomas said to him, My Lord, my Kyrios, and my God. He's saying, my Yahweh and my God. Uh, Paul, in Romans chapter 10, he says, You declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, which is two-pronged. 
It's obviously declaring like Jesus is Yahweh, but also Caesar thought he was Lord. Caesar thought that he was divine. So so attacking on two fronts there. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And that happens time and time. We pray Jesus is Lord. And that's not just, oh, yeah, Jesus is boss. It's this deep theological language of identifying Jesus as Yahweh. Mm. So we might skip the next slide and go straight to Jesus' limitations. Mm. We'll talk about um, in banter this week a bit about Jesus being accused of blasphemy by people both within the Jewish synagogue and, you know, from people Mm. outside the synagogue as well. But obviously we see then Jesus is Yahweh. Mm. But he's also fully man. He's fully yeah. God and fully man. And thereby he has limitations yeah. as a man. And we can see yeah. this in scripture, right? And this is a question from last week. And this is the, the tension of the incarnation. And so you read, say, Mark 13, um, 32, it says, But the day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And so people are like, well, if Jesus is really God, mm. shouldn't he know everything? Mm. And so there's sort of two schools of thought that, well... Jesus really isn't omniscient. He doesn't know everything. But then you'll never find this in Scripture. But theologians, as they unpack the mystery of Jesus, they came up with this sort of idea, what is called kenosis theory or kenosis theology, that Jesus emptied himself and had two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. And so the divine nature was sort of concealed when he was on earth. And so in his human nature, Jesus was limited. I have some verses here to show how Jesus was limited. We're told in Luke 2, 52, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It's riffing off some Old Testament heroes like Samuel and even Samson, people who grew in wisdom and stature. Jesus is asleep. So in his human form, Jesus was tired. Jesus, when he's fasting, he gets hungry. And so rather than disproving the deity of Jesus, it shows a sense that how Jesus... And we'll look at this passage in a little bit to close off. Jesus emptied himself. He humbled himself. Mm. Didn't, like, didn't see equality of God something to be grass. Mm. And said, yeah, humbled himself to death on a cross. Mm. And that's important to think about that. For this moment in time, Jesus was still fully God, but fully human. And in that human form had weaknesses. Mm. And so anytime and theologians argue that when Jesus has revelation omniscient um, when he does things that are divine it's because it's the father's will empowered by mm. the spirit awesome. Yeah, um, awesome so we've got that we might just go back one slide because mm. i think it'd be probably helpful to quickly say mm. um so we have looked at jesus was there at the very beginning mm. jesus um, and god reveal themselves as um, a human figure in the old testament and we see that in the new testament jesus is fully man and fully god mm. So what? <laughs> yeah, who cares? Who if cares? we didn't have Jesus in the Trinity, yeah. how would that change anything? If we yeah. just had God the Father and God the Spirit, mm. what would we miss out on without Jesus in the Trinity? So the short answer is we'd have no mediator, we'd have no redeemer, and we'd have no baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Humanity would be lost in its sin. Jesus as a man, he takes on very three key roles. He takes on the role of Adam to rule over the world. He takes on the role of priest to connect us to God, to be that human mediator. He takes on the role as the Davidic king, the son of David, to rule over this world. And, and the sacrificial lamb. And the sacrificial well. lamb, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we miss out on. You and I wouldn't be in this church building today. You and I wouldn't be saved by the blood of Jesus if Jesus didn't take on human flesh. Hmm. And that's what we miss out on. It is a mystery, and if your brain is slightly scrambled, that's a good thing. Because if you're like, yeah, I get that, that makes sense. It makes total sense that the angel of the Lord can also be Yahweh. And yeah, yeah, Yahweh appeared to Abraham as a man and with two other angels. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Actually, no, if you're scrambled, that's great. Because we want to wrestle in that mystery. Mm -hmm. And my prayer is that you guys actually say, wow, that... God from eternal existence, the one who was the word that became flesh, became flesh and loves me and cares for me. It's so easy to kind of just think, oh, yeah, Jesus God and Jesus my, like, yeah, he's just sort of there. Mm. But what I love about unpacking scripture like this, you just see the depth and the mystery of it. I'm also just left like awestruck mm. that this God, this Jesus, he cares for me so deeply. Mm. So that's why I wanted to finish with these words today, just to 
reminder for us and all theology friends needs to lead to practical outcomes. So head knowledge needs to translate to heart knowledge. So everything we've learned today, I want this to spur you on into how you live your life. And Paul sums this up beautifully. It says here in Philippians 2 verse 5, In your relationships with one another, have the same ma- mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That is the model for us. The angel of the Lord, one who is God himself, could humble himself as a servant. What excuse do we have? Mm. That's why I just find it just so humbling sitting under this, to sit under the word of God, the mystery of it. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't change your heart, friends. You need to check yourself. You need to check where you are with Jesus. Because this stuff is deeply profound and life-changing. And this is the model that we should have with each other. If God himself could do it, if Jesus could do this, this is how we should interact with everyone, with the world around us. And that will lead the transformation, the spread of God's kingdom. Love it. Well, Mitch, as we uh, call the band up, would you like to pray for us? I would love to pray. Yeah, Lord, as we just unpack some very heavy theology and just the tension of you being angel of the Lord and Yahweh and even just you taking on human flesh, we recognize and in that, Lord, that we may not fully understand you, but we understand what you have done for us upon the cross in the empty tomb and to give us an example of how to live as servants who serve one another and most importantly serve you. So I pray today, Lord, that we have a deeper love for what you've done, for who you are and the mystery of the three in one God. And I pray all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen.